Hey, I want to thank everybody for tuning back into this podcast. And please don't forget to watch our show at highwallclean.org. And please help support this not-for-profit podcast show by helping other people find and listen to this podcast. And all we need you to do is to listen, to watch, to rate, to subscribe, and to share. But most of all, we hope that you enjoy and that you learn something from the amazing guests that we have. You know, I was thinking recently, is it healthy to not allow our young children to experience pain? You know, as we hear stories of parents wanting to eliminate speech classes because they don't want them to feel too much anxiety and stress. You know, maybe in my podcast, some of the topics we talk about can be uncomfortable as we discuss suicide awareness, sex, substance abuse. Do we wait for our kids to experience these when they turn 18 and then the parents are no longer around to help them understand and work through their stress? What about kids that go to college and have drugs that are put in their face and told how cool they are? And this is precisely where the story of Buddhism started. And it was classified as the loss of innocence. So there was a young man who had been raised in a life of royal ease, comfort, um, wealthy, and he was shielded from the misery and the cruelties of the outside world. And he was distracted by sensual pleasures and luxurious living. But one day, he saw the real world, and it broke him to the core. He saw people suffering from sickness, old age, death, and was disturbed that this was our fate. He came across the holy man, and he discarded his family and his fortune and his kingdom in pursuit of the path of liberation. And the major question that he sought to answer was, how may suffering be ended? He wandered, he meditated, he studied with various teachers, and he attained high states of consciousness. But he did not find the answer to the question that he was looking for. You know, he tried everything he could think of, almost to the point of death by starvation, and nothing. He finally sat down under a Bodhi tree and eventually attained enlightenment. He became the Buddha, also known as the Awakened One. He had ascended through various stages of meditative awareness, and he had seen all of his past lives. And he had seen directly into reality, into the nature of existence and the causes of suffering and death. Now, he pondered whether to try to teach these things to the people, but he finally did decide that at least some of the people would be able to understand him. And more importantly, that they could be shown the path to arrive at these insights themselves. You know, he gave his first sermon to a few disciples and then continued to wander and teach for the next 45 years until his death at the age of 80. I want you to stay tuned as my guest today is going to bring the East to the West, and we are going to learn how perspective leads to inner peace, contentment, and fulfillment. And Maybe we're going to learn how to eliminate suffering and find a cure for the pain of human existence, as this was Buddha's main concern. I'll be right back. In a tree.
Good afternoon, everybody, and I'm ready to get high. My name is Eric McCoy. You know, thinking outside the box has been a strong pursuit for me. And, you know, as I've put together a lot of different programs myself, and, you know, whether they be a director for another program or putting together my own program. And I've received a lot of flack by many who, you know, were convinced that certain things were a must and that I needed to create something that they truly believed was the only way. Now, I don't have all the answers. And honestly, I don't believe anybody has all of the answers as we're dealing with a lot of different personalities. We're dealing with different qualities, educational levels, belief systems, character traits, and desires and wants of those that we work with. What I do know was that offering a multitude of ideas, finding a balance between trusting my clients with an understanding that a lot of times dishonesty is usually an unhealthy tool to avoid fear for a lot of people, and not always an image of defiance. You know, helping people learn to think for themselves has always been a big thing for me and not forcing something upon someone that I know that they're not gonna do. Now, we're not talking about teaching people the theory of relativity, which honestly, if I were, my clients would be in trouble <laughs> as I spent hours trying to figure it out and actually I'm more confused after doing that. The, the word that I like to use is creativity, which brings me to my guest today. And Dr. Jeff, Skolnick is going to bring that to us today. You know, I was really intrigued when, and I believe it was his marketing director that reached out to me regarding his unique method, which you, or our listeners, and I are actually going to learn more about together. He's the creator of Satori West Method, which is where, from what I understand, he, the East meets the West. And it joins together Buddhist wisdom with modern brain behavioral and wellness sciences. Now, according to his website, it brings all the areas of your life together in a way that guides you to happiness and peace. He is a 40 year Zen Buddhist meditator and senior Zen teacher, which we're gonna learn about together a brain researcher in neuropsychology, a PhD in natural health science, and he's also an author. Dr. Skolnick, I wanna thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Eric. You know, before we begin, I wanna tell you that I obviously have looked over your website and you know, was very intrigued about this because I came to realize that you know, a lot of ideas behind your philosophy and, you know, and, and actually, especially the five points of your method that we're going to talk about um, fit tightly with years of experience in regards to healing, which are actually laid out in my book. And I wrote a book called Pain, Failure and Misery are the Stepping Stones to Success. And this book evolved from my personal experience with drug addiction myself that nearly killed me and also the lessons that I gained from my clients in regards to a more um, you know, effective style of teaching where I found great statistics, honestly, within my clients. But you know, the first question I like to ask you, and I, wanna, and I like to ask everybody this is, you know, what brought you to be interested in working with mental illness and substance use disorders? Oh, uh, well, you, you kind of missed in the in introduction. I'm, I'm a psychiatrist. Okay. Um, and so my, the Satori West method, uh, I've been using it with, with patients. And obviously, people with psychiatric conditions have a lot of comorbid or associated uh, substance use as well. So um, I finally implemented my, my method in a psychiatric hospital that also had substance use disorder units. And so it was used in both in both uh, types of venues, and and pretty successfully so. Now, 
your approach and what's called the Satori West method, um, and you have these five points that yeah. it talks about. Um, explain to me a little bit about what those are. So the, the five points start with number one, uh, and it's pretty much, I mean, anyone who's listening to your, to your program and watching your program will say, well, duh, we know that. But the first point is that life is hard for all human beings mm -hmm. and that life really embody, embodies a lot of emotional struggles and that everyone, even if they look like they're on some Pepsi commercial and having a great time, everyone's holding on to a lot. And we all, life is just a series of crises that everybody goes through. It's not just like midlife or adolescent crises. It's loss, it's, it's, it's getting ill. It's having substance use and mental health issues. Everyone is dealing with something, no matter how rich and famous you are, we're all kind of accumulating a lot of, of emotional baggage. And there's no, there are no exceptions to that. Not me, not you, no one. And the, but the second point is, you can unwind it. So the second point is that all the reasons I just mentioned to you, all the crises that we go through in life are not the actual reasons why human beings suffer. Um, and so what the method talks about is that it has everything to do with the human brain and how the brain is configured for survival. So all, all animal brains from reptiles up to primates, what makes the brain uh, evolve is that it, they're survival machines. So if an animal wants something or doesn't want something, it focuses its attention on it, right? So if, uh, you know, if a cat sees a mouse, it's going to focus its attention on it. And if you see, you know, if you see a lion or whatever, you're going to focus your, your attention on it. So even if you see chocolate cake and you want it, you'll focus your attention on it. So what happens, however, is that in humans, that focused attention actually warps our reality. It warps our, our, our experience of the moment. So humans are not just, you know, cats and other, other animals. We have, we have intelligence. So we can think and plan. We, can, we love stories. So we're focused on those. We have imagination. So we're focused on the best thing that we could ever have and the worst thing that we could possibly avoid. And we also have a sense of self. That sense of self wants recognition. It wants meaning. It wants approval. It wants to avoid shame. It wants to avoid being emotionally hurt. And so all day long, our attention is focused on those things. But that focus causes what I call tunnel vision. And tunnel vision has eight aspects to it. And without going in too much detail, in general, when you focus your attention on something, whether you want it or you don't want it, the first thing that happens is that you lose control. And this is very important in terms of substance use disorders because like if, I, if I'm a diabetic or I'm overweight and I stare down a chocolate cake, the longer I stare it down, somehow I'm gonna wind up eating it. So it, you, you tend to lose control. It's sort of a stimulus response thing. The, the next thing, that so after your attention is grabbed, you lose control. Um, you start blocking out things that you don't want to see because you're so focused on the thing. The other thing that happens is that you start to become more suggestible. Like you start believing things and you take things as true that you wouldn't normally take as true. So this may seem a little odd, but that's what hypnotists do, or that's what, that's what marketers do when they watch you or have you watch a television commercial. If they can grab your attention, no matter what it is, they can get you to believe and buy their product just because they grabbed your attention. The other thing it does is it increases your sense of self, your ego. Oh, well, before that, it also puts you into your imagination so that you start experiencing the moment more from like as much in your imagination as in reality. So like if you're staring down a chocolate cake, you're going to be kind of fantasizing about it. That's just going to start happening. And the next thing that's very important, the kind of the, the major aspect of this and why there's so much suffering is that it, it, that sense of self I spoke to you about gets greatly magnified. Even if you're just staring down chocolate cake or you hear a noise somewhere outside, whatever it is that grabs your attention, your sense of self gets magnified. 
where you start to take things personally. It's where you start to start getting competitive or you, you, uh, you see yourself as the outside of the world looking in or the center of attention. All those things are part of that sense of self. And when that happens, it distorts your thinking. And when your thinking gets distorted, where you start rationalizing, jumping to conclusions, thinking you know the, what the future holds, catastrophizing, et cetera, et cetera. So all those elements make up tunnel vision. And that's the second point of the Satori West method. So that's at the far end of the, that's at the kind of one end of the continuum is when your attention is grabbed and it holds you and it, and it warps your personality and it causes you to suffer. Um, and so the opposite of that is when your attention is widened. It's not inclusive. It's not exclusive. It's inclusive. Your awareness is open and you have a sense of, of, being of yourself. So let me just, let me just drill into why we, why the, so the other side is called perspective and perspective happens. The reason why it happens also has to do with the configuration of the human brain that most animals, almost all animals have as well is that we don't have just one brain sitting in our head. We have two of them. And these brains actually, if you study them and if you, you can, can you know, uh, you can dissect the, the fibers that connect them. They each have separate awareness and they each have separate ways of seeing the world. They each have separate personalities and preferences, etc. Well, when those two parts are trained on each other, that's what's called self-awareness or reflective awareness. That's what helps you know that you're here right now, that you're alive. And when those two parts are trained more on each other than not, you kind of start coming awake and you realize, and these are the things that, you know, you talk about being high while clean. These are the elements of being high while clean is that you start really getting a sense of the magnitude of what it means that you're alive right now, that you got to be born, for instance. And you start to fall in love with your experience in the moment of just being you that sense of ego that we talked about gets greatly diminished and it actually can go away, but, or fall way into the background and that there's, there's a liberation from that. It's a sense that you are just free to be creative, to feel, to see irony and humor because that widened awareness lets you step back and see the moment in context, right? So if someone is screaming at you and they're cursing you and flipping you off, your natural survival instinct is to want to focus on them. And then you go into tunnel vision, start taking it personally, getting angry, distorted thinking. But if you can step back and have a wide awareness and be aware of being in the moment and what it means that you're here right now, then you go like, wow, what's, what's their problem? You can see them for who they are rather than who, what your imagination projects them to be. So, uh, that widened awareness, that perspective is the, is what in the brain allows creativity. It allows you to see novelty and beauty and that, that kind of thing. So that's all the elements of what it means to be high while clean. So that's the third point of the Satori West method. So the fourth, the fourth point is how do you go from tunnel vision to, to wide perspective, maybe even like very wide perspective where you're really, really grateful that you're alive kind of, kind of feeling that, like, you know, a high level of maturity and wisdom and humor and creativity. Well, I mean, it starts, there are four different ways, but in general, it's recognize that you're in tunnel vision because that's perspective by itself. Because if you don't know you're in tunnel vision, then you're just lost. The second thing is to practice these brain shifting skills that I, that I have come up with that are really mindfulness mm -hmm. plus. The third thing is, is to practice wellness. So I've identified six, you talked about bringing together your areas of your life. So there are six spheres of wellness, it's physical, mental, social, organizational, moral, and existential wellness. And each one of those by themselves can sort of almost force your brain into perspective. Because like in the physical realm, if you feel good, if your body is energized and relaxed, you're going to naturally have a sense of perspective. If you have mental health, you have love in your life, if, you're, if your life is organized, if you're living according to moral precepts, if you're acting kind with integrity, et cetera, 
you naturally are kind of encouraging your brain to have perspective. It's kind of guiding it towards it. And the last is existential wellness. So if you do things that help you appreciate your existence, whether you practice religion or you just practice gratitude every day, or you see beauty and art in just the mundane things. So all those areas of wellness kind of force your brain into perspective. And so if you practice it from the inside out and the outside in, you're going to have a, a really high level of, of, of wellness. So the, the fifth point of the Satori West method and the last way that you can, you can find perspective is just exactly, Eric, what you said, is that somehow crises and hardship tend to like, you know, like a rubber band, the more you kind of stretch it, the more you're building up this sort of potential energy that becomes sort of kinetic energy that pulls, that springboards you. Crises and hardship can springboard you to great levels of perspective, even, even awakened levels. I think, you know, Bill Smith, you know, you know, experienced that as part of his story as well. One of the things that crises and, and hardship does is that it makes your tunnel vision visible because for you and me right now, our tunnel vision is relatively invisible. So one of the things it does is it makes it makes it visible why you are suffering so much. You can, you can see it if somebody points it out to you, it's, it's definitely clear. So that when I talk to patients in the hospital with psychiatric illness, or I talk to patients in my hospital who are in a rehab unit and I tell them about tunnel vision, they get it on a visceral level that even I can't fully viscerally understand. And sometimes people suffer so much. Their tunnel vision is so constricted that their thinking, their sense of ego is so grossly distorted that it puts them into crisis. That's the definition of a crisis, the Satori West definition. And so sometimes the brain cannot tolerate it anymore and it just opens. It stops focusing on individual things and it opens up and the two hemispheres then can are free to see each other more, more clearly. You really um, hit on, I think, a lot of very important things. I, so I work in the substance abuse field. Um, I'm a teacher. I'm also um, a, a counselor. Uh, obviously, I do this podcast, which is great because I get an opportunity to meet a lot of great people and a lot of different people, you started out and you really touched on something that, that I reached out with was like the entertainment industry, um, you know, and people that are in that world and how their suffering is no different than anybody else's, you know, I mean, they, you know, you can blast them on the TV and you see this role that they're playing that is not real. And I've had uh, some great people on my podcast um, that have expressed that and have told those stories. And your philosophy to me is fantastic. This is why I'm so interested in this. Um, you know, one of the things that I teach a lot is self-esteem, for instance. And, you know, we talked, you, you had mentioned advertising, which is right on because I, you know, I teach clients that, you know, advertisers work to appeal to your emotions, which is a, you know, neurological impulse that pushes you to act upon something. They want you to get off your ass and go buy, you know, whatever it is that they're trying to sell. Right. And so positive affirmations are kind of designed in that same format, you know, to obviously change a belief system into something that's more helpful. Um, and I really like your, um, your, you know, the, the perspective side to it. Um, you know, we don't describe the world we see, we see the world that we describe, which I think is, you know, is right, you know, right on in that fashion. Substance abuse for me, you know, I was a methamphetamine addict to the core, you know, and, you know, you're talking about like, you know, the concept of cravings, um, you know, tunnel vision, you know, when, when I am on methamphetamine, that's all I have. There's one thing I'm thinking about. It's only that one thing that I am going towards. Yeah. And everything that I do is revolving around that one thing. That's tunnel vision. <laughs> you get it. And, you know, in a way that honestly, even I can't even fully fathom. So, yeah. 
Yeah, it's uh it's you know addiction is definitely powerful and um you know this is uh so do you now you, being a psychiatrist do you believe in um medications? Mm-hmm. And um uh, and I know you're um you know you're bringing the east to the west with the uh style of Buddhism. Yes. Um uh, and I know with you know boot you know it was, you know, it, you know, the Buddha, you know, his, you know, his question that he was always asking was, you know, about suffering. You yes. Know, how to end, is there a way that we can end the suffering? Right. And, um, and I think personally suffering um, or pain as, you know, we, I, I don't really like the word suffering as much, but pain is a guarantee in life. And I personally think it is one of the greatest gifts we have uh, because without it, we would learn nothing. <laughs> there would be nothing that we could learn um, without having that pain to sort of push us in that, into learning something. I don't know if you, what, you, what your stance is on that idea. Um. There's a difference between pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. So, and it's important to understand that, uh, that when Buddha talked about, so about, you know, the five points of of the Satori West method, they're really the Buddha's four noble truths. Plus I added a truth that most Zen masters like, yeah, okay, you're right. should have added that. Um, (laughs) um, So when you are, if you're going to, if we're going into Buddhism, so we talk about enlightenment because Buddha said enlightenment was the end of suffering and perspective is the, is the gateway to enlightenment, but I don't think you need to go for full enlightenment. Just even a modicum amount of perspective is enough to give you great relief from your really oppressive ego. So the pain aspect is that what suffering is, it's an identification with, with pain because the ego is identifying it because it's in tunnel vision. But when the brain is not in tunnel vision, when you're enlightened, it's not like a blissed out state where you're like on a drug high all the time. You can feel great sadness. You can feel righteous anger. It's just that it's not personalized. You know, you can feel sad, which is pain. You can feel even physical pain. I mean, mindfulness is being used in pain clinics around the country. It's not like the pain goes away, but the perception of the pain, you're not suffering it. And when you don't suffer it, 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 it morphs it into something different. That's a form of energy and not information that is that you're identifying with. And so if that helps, there, there is a difference between pain, pain and suffering. Yeah. It's kind of, you know, with the title of my book, you know, like pain, failure and misery, um, you know, and misery, I think, is um, is an option, you know, if you, depending on how you choose to look at something, right. Um, you know, I can look at, you know, um, you know, pain is an opportunity. Misery can be a choice, (laughs) you know, in terms of how we, how we want to view something. Um, do you have a facility or is this something that you do? So your, your method and the, the method that you talk about, how does this work in terms of, do you bring this to people in hospitals? So I have a, I have a company and the company created, and the company has the Satori West method and it was installed in a psychiatric hospital and in their outpatient program. It was their three week outpatient curriculum that, that program has actually been pulled out of the hospital and out of the partial hospital because we're going to get ready to launch it and sell it to many psychiatric hospitals and many outpatient settings. It's also the, it's also the curriculum that goes into what we're calling a life club where you join and you kind of drill through these five points anywhere from six months to, to five years. So, uh, I do have a book coming out soon that will kind of drill into a little bit more. So that's what the company's goal is, is to license these programs and then to, to different, different companies, not just psychiatric. So life clubs can be for people with depression or, or whatever. You can also have life clubs in hospitals 
for patients with diabetes, whatever, to look at it from a medical perspective. You can have it in, in, in health clubs. You can have them in corporations. You can have them in schools and universities so that kids can learn that they're in tunnel vision from a really young age. They can maybe start to unwind it. So that's what my company is all about. And does it include like meditational type stuff? Yeah, so brain shifting is the, is the centerpiece of the Satori West method. So there's a, we have a diagram on the walls. We had it on the walls of the hospital and, you know, and all these various uh, handouts they had. And the diagram kind of shows this sort of small arrow that's, that says tunnel vision. And then there's this, these five circle, six circles that are the various spheres of wellness. And in the middle, the big circle is brain shifting. And so the brain shifting part of the middle is where you practice these you know, how you train the two parts of your brain on each other and open your awareness, that kind of thing. Uh, and then how the spheres of wellness kind of contribute to that or, or augment it. And then there's a big arrow at the other side that shows perspective. So um, that's the kind of the whole method right there in a visual nutshell. And how do people, um, how, how is it working for people? Like how easy is it for people to grasp? I, I, you know, I've been told not to say this, but I have to say, I am never, I, I never cease to be shocked at how well it works. Um, even with my own patients that I work with it, I, I had one patient who would just like, he, without revealing too much, I mean, he came into a, he was involuntarily committed to a psychiatric hospital and he was just a, a mess. He'd just done all these horrible things. And when I explained to him, I said, you're in tunnel vision. It's not, you know, people like think, well, it's my fault. I should be better. You know, it's like, this is tunnel. Vision. This is what your brain has been compelling you to do. He did some very awful things. He had restraining orders <laughs> against him. He was just a hot mess. He was suicidal. He, he was a stay at home. It was just a lot, a lot going on. And that, just that one realization, remember we talked about the first step in, in the path to getting perspective is to see your own tunnel vision? That just transformed him. So the, the tech, you know, I mentioned that we had a three week partial hospital program where that's all for five hours a day, it was all Satori West. And the testimonials we got, people wanted to do video testimonials because they loved it so much. So I guess it works. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. How did you come upon this method? Well, so, you know, I had two separate tracks, right? So I, I wanted to be a psychiatrist from the age of 15 because I read a textbook of psychology that talked about the brain. It said, isn't it amazing that this, this brain, which is just basically chemicals, can wake up and know it's alive? And they're like, Pfft. Then I was like, oh my God, I had to be a psychologist. And then I went into psychiatry instead for whatever reason. Uh, and then in, while I was a psychiatrist, I was also in a PhD program in neuropsychology where I did brain research. Mm -hmm. So coincidentally, at the same time, um, my parents were killed and I started to do Zen Buddhist meditation like exactly 40 years ago or 41 years ago now. Um, and so Doing, being a Zen Buddhist for 40 years, studying the brain and being a psychiatrist, it occurred to me, wow, they're really talking about the same thing. And that's where I started to integrate it and use it clinically and also talk about it in Zen circles as well. Okay, I got to ask you some questions on Buddhism here. I just have more. <laughs> you know, in my mind, I always picture, you know, obviously the people in the robes that just sit yeah. and meditate for days and weeks and months and years. Yes. On end. Um, what is, and I, and I understand the concept of, you know, just learning to become at peace with the world around us, with, with ourselves, um, maybe, uh, uh, you know, just that comfortability, um, it, to me now, I know Buddhists don't believe in a God and they don't believe in an afterlife. Is that correct? Uh, well, you know, Zen is a little, is a little different than there are many sects of Buddhism. Okay. Uh, you know, there are Theravadan Buddhists that believe in re reincarnation. Um, because that 
because Buddha was a Hindu when, you know, when he, before he woke up and then had his own kind of philosophy, ideology. Um, so uh, it's, the answer is a little complicated, but they, I think the basic Buddhist lore has a lot to do with, with reincarnation. I've heard that reinterpreted. And what I accept personally is that we are sort of reincarnating every moment as we open up to perspective. There's sort of a new kind of a, we see the moment as fresh and new when you have high degree of perspective. Every moment is novel. And in that sense, there's sort of a reincarnation going on. That answers your question. Yeah. Now, did you ever go out there and, and like to India and, and or some of these other places and be a part of this? Or was this? <laughs> well, I've been, a, I've been a Zen Buddhist for 40 years. So I've been on many week-long retreats where you sit for six hours a day and then the rest you do chanting and work meditation and that kind of thing. I haven't been to India okay. uh, yet. I've been to Japan, which is the seat of Zen Buddhism. And I always think, what are they waiting on? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> well, that is a that is that's an under, that's a Zen understanding. Is that you don't get enlightened. There's nothing to do, right? This it's a little bit of advanced understanding, but and if you think about it in terms of the brain, your brain is already. You know, we talk about the two parts of your brain that are focused on each other that give you this sense of the, the, the miracle that it took that you got to be, be, be here right now, right? So if you just give me a sec, Eric, let me just, let me just drill into this for a second. So if you think about what, what it took for you to be here right now, right? So the universe somehow to come into existence out of its empty balance, you know, that singularity kind of exploded then, you know, all these you know, eons of generations of, of evolution. And then this one singular planet had to have enough water and the right chemicals. And those chemicals somehow got together, were able to replicate themselves into life. And then that life evolved through trillions of, 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 of mistakes. And then, you know, all of your ancestors, all of your human ancestors had to meet at exactly the perfect time. And then your parents had a meet and then that one sperm out of millions hit the one egg out of hundreds. Your existence is, you won the cosmic lottery because your existence is, a, is miraculous. And if you were, and what training both parts of your brain on each other tell you is what, how enormous this moment is and that this, this precious second is never gonna happen again. And that there's a completeness to that. And in terms of Buddhism, the understanding is that you already know this. No one's telling, no one has to tell you this. It just, you just have to sort of see it for yourself. If you can just get out of your own tunnel vision, it'll become very clear to you. You don't have to do anything. So in that sense, your brain is already enlightened. Your brain is already ready. You just have to allow it to shift enough that brain shift thing that I talk about enough to just see that this moment is not going to change. There's no better moment. This moment, however, like you mentioned before, Eric, when you, when you perceive this moment in a different light, you wake up to it in a whole new way. And so what meditation really is, it's, it's brain shifting and um, it's really, you know, one famous Zen master said, it's really selling water by the river you know, awareness really, like for me, was a big key, you know, just becoming aware of, you know, I think more of the reality behind life, you know, more of the, you know, the, I, I don't know if I would have called it in light, you know, the enlightenment per se, because I, I know back in that time, I didn't really probably even understand that word, but, <laughs> you know, but, um, but awareness, I think was really that, you know, um, what really kind of woke me up, you know, and, um, and, and learning to see the beauty in the world and not looking at all of the negativity and the horrible things. And, you know, um, you know, I can look at things as problems or they can be opportunities, you know, right. and that's what I, I love to tell clients that, you know, and that's, um, I don't have problems anymore. I have opportunities or opportunities for growth. Pain is an opportunity for growth, you know? Um, now, if, any, any of our listener, inter, listeners are interested in learning about your, where are you located? 
So I, I'm in Seattle. Okay. Um, but the, you know, there is, there are no current programs where our company is just forming and we're going to be reaching out. So we're going to, we'll have a strong psychiatric mental health aspect to it. We hope to move into the substance use disorder community. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then there'll be life clubs for all kinds of different populations. Um, but the where the place you can actually find out what we're up to and more about the Satori West method uh, is satoriwest.com. Okay. S-A-T-O-R-I. And by the way, the word Satori is the Japanese Buddhist word for awakening. And the West is the brain, the brain part. And then you have books. You have a book that the brain, what was, what's the first one you wrote? So it's kind of old at this point, um, but you know, it's still in the, within the subject realm. <laughs> it's called Awaken Your Brain, you. Coming Alive to Vibrant Well-Being in a New Reality. And then you have a new one coming out. Yeah, really shortly, probably within, within a month um, called Blessed by Distress. Huh. Um, how hardship and crisis can be opportunities using the Satori West method. Blessed by the stress. I love that. <laughs> kind of similar to your title. <laughs> Absolutely. Fit, fits right in line. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, if you had a message to give to people out there struggling, you know, substance abuse, um, uh, mental health, any of that kind of stuff, what would that be? It, it's the same message to any human being, unless you're, unless you have so much perspective that you really get it is that see your tunnel vision. Um, it's there. If you can, if you can see how your attention is being grabbed from you, if you can see how you're, how that causes you to lose control, how it makes you more believable, more gullible, honestly, how it makes you believe things more, how it, it warps. The most thing we can really see is how our sense of self, our ego is inflamed. So the sense of like, I feel like I'm the, everyone's, you go outside, everyone is noticing me, or you're in the outside looking in, or you take everything personally that you know is not personal, or you super competitive, or you feel like you're right about everything. See your tunnel vision. Because if you can see it, then you can start to unwind it and get a modicum of perspective. And until you can, there's no amount of meditation or, or wellness, whatever, that's going to really work if you can't see that the cause of your unhappiness, of your suffering. Yeah. And obviously with people on, you know, the substance, they need to stop the drugs first. You know, you're never going to be able to you know, find that tunnel vision, see that tunnel vision, get out of that tunnel vision. Um, obviously until you let go of the drugs first, you know, to be able to, to do that. I mean, you can do, so the wellness, you know, part of physical wellness is not using intoxicants, at least, at least to the point where it's, it's toxic, you know, but, um, so I mean the wellness part and the brain shifting part work hand in hand. So how that works with, with substance abuse. So like there, there are times, there are evenings where I, you know, where I really want to eat after nine o'clock and I have just tremendous reflux and it really makes it hard to sleep. But that, that urge, it's like, it's like an itch that you want to scratch. If I can, if I can brain shift with that urge, with that itch, feel it fully. And, and let it kind of wake me up. Like you talked about how pain can do that. Urges can do that too. Then eventually the urge tends to, to morph into something different and the self-control comes back and the fantasy and the wanting and all those things start to kind of slowly kind of fade away. So, I mean, obviously making a commitment, that's part of moral wellness is making a commitment to yourself to be kind, to not use intoxicants, whatever, um, is important, but what must go hand in hand is your own self-regulation internally and your own awareness and opening up your awareness in very specific ways. Within our philosophy, I think we're very closely related. Um, and that's actually fantastic because, you know, when you're working with uh, people in substance abuse you've not necessarily been through it yourself from that side of it per se to at least to the extreme that I'm aware of. 
Um, <laughs> but you get it, you know, and I, and I think that's, I think that's powerful. Um, because, you know, and I, and I tell people all the time that, you know, you don't obviously have to have gone through this stuff yourself to do it, but if you want to understand and, and you're looking for empathy and you're looking to be able to work with those types of people, you have to have the empathy and want to understand. And yeah. you do. And that's the thing. That's what I get with you is that I really feel that you have that, that um, understanding and real desire to want to understand. Yeah. And make a difference. You know, do you have a minute or two just to let me make, I guess, one point that I think. Please. Maybe helpful. I, I I find this point, you know, in writing my book, editing my book, and in talking to very advanced Zen Buddhist meditators, and very, very stuck people with psychiatric issues and substance use issues. It's I have to. I often find myself giving the same message, mm-hmm. that it's very hard to get away from the idea that perspective does not mean changing the moment, and that people always want. People always want to find a better moment in the future. That's precisely what puts you into tunnel vision. And that accepting this moment and loving and appreciating the moment exactly the way it is, even with the urge to relapse, even so I'm not saying to relapse, Mm -hmm. but I'm saying that accepting the urge, accepting the moment, loving your experience. That's what the two brains together do for you. That's what your two hemispheres can do for you. And you can just get, they're already doing it. Mm -hmm. So if you are, if the idea is to be so okay in this moment, even with your urges, even with the good things and the bad things, that's what being high while clean is about. It's, it's loving your existence as it is currently. Yes. And absolutely right. Um, When you do get a craving, accepting it is, is how you are going to ultimately work through it. Because the problem is a lot of people just like to push it down, you know, or pretend like it doesn't exist. And, and right. as time goes on, it's going to feed it, you know, and as time goes on, it's eventually going to creep up and right. it eventually can get to a point to where, you know, you, you can't really reach that place of acceptance and you're just off and running. Right. Um, and so, yeah, hundred percent accepting it is, I believe the key to it, you know, I, you know, I tell the same thing to, I tell that to people who are chemically dependent. I also tell that to my patients who hear voices or have delusions. It's like, you know, if you try to push it away, you're actually paying attention to it. And if you pay attention to it, you're giving it power. Mm -hmm. If you open your awareness around it, you're diffusing that. It just becomes it just becomes a form of energy that that then lets you wake up even more. Yes, yes. Now you don't want to obviously feed it per se. You know, no. um, the more we talk about it, up it, and you know, are like, oh yeah, it was great and it was wonderful. <laughs> you know, that's a different story, obviously. Yes. Um, then we're pulling that memory from the amygdala, right? We're just, you know. And then we just want to go do it, right? Um, but yeah. 100%, I agree with you. That's um, um, now this is very exciting to me. I, I was, uh, you know, the more I looked into what you're doing and, and your philosophy um, and a lot of your ideas, it, it really hits home. And I, I really agree with it. And I appreciate you, uh, you know, coming and doing this. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope. Um, that you you can you know do something big with this and and that way more people can have an opportunity you know to to right. be able to experience this um we have this potential waiting inside our brain and it is just it's sad almost heartbreaking that we can't just shift our brain a little bit and and people can start having you know a different experience of life so thank you for helping me do that to help me kind of communicate it Hey, I want to thank everybody for tuning in to another episode of High Wall Clean. Keep getting high. Let's do it clean and sober. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks. Darkness, we find the light.